cargo ship makes its way through one of the locks of the Panama Canal. Many observers have considered the completion of the Panama Canal to be the eighth wonder of the world. Of course, getting on one of these lists depends on one's perspective. Still, there is no argument that this was a massive project and one that changed the world in many ways. Construction work on the canal across the Isthmus of Panama was actually begun by France in the 19th century, but the project was soon abandoned because of the high cost, both financially and in terms of human mortality. Thousands of lives lost to a combination of factors, including insect-borne diseases such as malaria and yellow fever. When the United States took over the project in 1904, it began a decade-long effort involving tens of thousands of workers from all over the world. The canal officially opened in 1914. Now, more than 100 years later, it is not only still in operation, but in fact a major expansion was just recently completed. But at what cost? Between the French and American construction efforts, tens of thousands of lives were lost, many of these to the mosquito-borne diseases of malaria, dengue, and yellow fever. Yellow fever in particular presented with high mortality rates and fearsome symptoms, including fever, jaundice, and internal bleeding resulting in bloody vomit. Here you can see an electron microscopic image of the yellow fever viral particles, or virions, that cause this hemorrhagic disease. Dengue, yellow fever, chikungunya, and now Zika are all viral diseases transmitted through the bite of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Fortunately, scientists around this time began to understand the role of mosquitoes as vectors for diseases like yellow fever. There were many notable figures such as Walter Reed and this man, Dr. William Gorgas, a U.S. Army medical officer who many consider a savior of the Panama Canal effort. With a huge team of workers, Dr. Gorgas directed the mosquito eradication efforts using multiple interventions such as fumigations and spraying oil on open water surfaces to prevent development of the larvae. However, mosquito-borne diseases are still very serious world health problems. This map from 2006, for example, indicates areas of the world infested with Aedes aegypti mosquitoes in blue and in red areas with epidemic dengue fever, one of the diseases transmitted by the species. This is why it is so critical to try to understand the basic biology of mosquitoes, including the evolution of human biting preference. The case study that you'll be working on is based on a 2014 paper published in the journal Nature. Got blood? Mosquito Project Part 1 deals with the genetic and evolutionary aspects of human biting preference in Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito. That is, the authors were asking whether human biting preference is an evolved, heritable trait in some populations of mosquitoes, and if so, what gene or genes might be involved. The same nature paper also describes the physiological experiments that the authors then conducted to look at how different populations of Aedes aegypti might be able to distinguish between human and non-human hosts in terms of their biting preference. These topics, however, will not be covered in this particular case study. There's no question that animal biting, that is to say non-human biting, is the ancestral trait in mosquitoes. One piece of evidence for this is a recent finding of a fossil mosquito with its abdomen still containing remnants of a blood meal, as shown in this image. This fossil is 46 million years old, meaning that mosquitoes were biting for blood meals long before the evolution of humans. So the question is why, or how, have some mosquitoes become specialized for human biting, while most mosquitoes prefer either non-human animals or have no preference? Aedes aegypti turns out to be a really good system to address this question because it turns out there are both human preferring and non-human preferring forms or subspecies of the species. These are images from the nature paper showing the two different forms, a domestic form on the left and an ancestral forest form on the right. Notice that the two forms are quite distinctive in coloration, so it's fairly easy to tell them apart, at least up close. The forest form actually resembles a sub-Saharan African subspecies of Aedes aegypti called Formosus. So its full scientific name would be Aedes aegypti Formosus, and this would be the ancestral subspecies. The lighter colored domestic form on the left specializes in biting humans and resembles a subspecies mostly from Asia called aegypti. 
So its full scientific name would be Aedes aegypti aegypti. As the word domestic suggests, it tends to live in or around human dwellings. In the case study, we will mostly refer to these two subspecies as the forest and domestic forms. Despite these differences, the two forms are considered to be the same species, Aedes aegypti. You may have already learned that there are several alternative ways to define what is a species. So you might start thinking about the following observations documented in several studies from the 1970s. First, although populations of the two different forms can be found living quite close to each other, say within a few hundred meters, and although a peridomestic or hybrid population was also described, the forest and domestic populations, for the most part, tend to stay separated from each other. For example, the forest form avoids homes and humans, and their breeding behavior is quite different from the domestic form. For example, they lay their eggs in natural rainwater collecting sources, such as tree stumps. The domestic form, on the other hand, lives in or near human habitations and lays their eggs in domestic water storage containers such as barrels or pots. And of course, as already mentioned, the two forms seem to have a distinct biting preference for humans or for non-human animals. So it would seem that the two forms have undergone considerable genetic divergence based on these behavioral differences. At the same time, if you take males and females from the two forms and put them together in the laboratory, as the authors of this paper did, they will interbreed and they will produce viable fertile offspring. So this is really important because it means that the experimental system used by the authors of the Nature paper lends itself to a genetic approach to the central question, which is what evolutionary changes have occurred between these two populations, the two subspecies, that have resulted in human biting preference. Just for orientation, we should note that the study that was published in Nature took place in a small village in Kenya. Here's a map of Africa highlighting Kenya, and if we use Google Maps, you can see that the village, known as Rabai, is located near the coast and not far from the city of Mombasa. This is the same study site that had been used in previous work published some years ago. If you look at the map from the Nature paper, you can see several of the locations where mosquitoes were collected from both human dwellings and forest sites. What's really nice about the study site is how close the two subspecies live to each other, although for the most part, continuing to stay separated from each other. For example, only rarely would a forest mosquito be found in a human dwelling in the village. So now, let's briefly summarize what we know so far. First, ancestral mosquitoes obtain their blood meals from non-human animals. Second, the so-called forest form, or the Formosus subspecies, is still around and still populating forested areas. They tend to avoid human areas and they use natural standing water sources for their development. The domestic form, on the other hand, deliberately lives near human populated areas, uses domestic water sources, and importantly, specializes in biting humans for their blood meal. Finally, the forest and domestic forms can interbreed and form viable and fertile offspring but the extent to which the two populations mingle seems to be minimal. All of which means that there is clear genetic divergence between the forest and domestic subspecies in both morphology and behavior. So again, the big question is, what evolutionary change occurred to the domestic subspecies that resulted in human biting preference? Enjoy the case. Got blood? Mosquito Project Part 1. Thank <laughs> you.